Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today I'm going to talk about uh, trypanosomiasis, uh, which is, is an important condition and which is caused by a different uh, species belonging to the genus uh, Trypanosoma. Uh, it is causing different conditions and different kind of vectors are involved in the transmission of these parasites and uh, the most uh, common form, uh, African uh, trypanosomiasis, which is also known as the sleeping sickness, is caused by a species belonging to this particular genus of uh, trypanosoma. So um, in sleeping sickness, people uh, would often experience, experience uh, sleeping disturbances, and most of the people would be sleepy during daytime. Uh, and during nighttime, uh, their sleep is disturbed. And there are other neurological symptoms that people would go through. And some of the symptoms uh, are uh, of different kind. Uh, for instance, some deformity in some tissues can be caused by some species belonging to this particular uh, genus. And uh, it can also lead to a very fatal condition which is known as meningoencephalitis, in which the brain tissue is inflamed uh, to a degree which uh, can even cause death among a number of people who are infected. So, uh, so these uh, uh, are these uh, hemoflagellates, the blood uh, are in, the, uh, also called the blood and tissue protozoa. These are unicellular organisms uh, which can be found in the blood and uh, other cells of your body uh, because some of them are intracellular, they will live inside uh, the cells and some of them are uh, extracellular which live outside the cells and cause different conditions. This family uh, trypanosomatidae includes hemoflagellates which contain only two genera that parasitize human beings. And what are those two genera? It's uh, the genus Lish Lishmania and the genus uh, Trypanosoma. The genus Lishmania, Lishmania uh, are always intracellular, you know. Uh, its members belonging to the genus Lishmania live intracellularly on inside the cells and principally in the cells of the reticular endothelial system. The reticular endothelial system, you know about this system, uh, the RBCs, uh, reticulocytes, which are formed uh, inside your body, which are important part of your blood and are made in the bone marrow, uh, can be infected by these different uh, species belonging to the genus Lishmania. And the genus Trypanosoma contains members that may be found in the blood and intracellularly in cardiac muscles. So uh, there are different species, you know. Uh, one species uh, in this genus, which is known as Trypanos uh, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, lives inside the cardiac muscle cells. So that is intracellular. And other species belonging to Trypanosoma trypanosoma genus are extracellular so they can be found in the blood. The African form, uh, form of the disease which is caused by uh, uh, trypanosoma brucei uh, is the blood form. The trypanosoma brucei is not intracellular. It lives outside uh, you know the cells inside your blood while the American form uh, which is also known as the Chagas disease. In that form, the cardiac muscles are infected and it is caused by trypanosoma cruzi, which lives inside the cardiac muscles. And these hemoflagellates, uh, you know, people ask questions that how uh, they uh, started infecting human beings. These, uh, if you look at their evolutionary history, these hemoflagellates, uh, are original parasites of insects. They are transmitted by insects and they undergo several developmental stages in insects. And the arthropod serves as intermediate host. So uh, there are a number of their developmental stages which can be recognized morphologically. 
that uh, would develop inside these insects. So originally, these are the insect parasites, but these insect parasites have uh, changed uh, their survival strategies uh, during this uh, their uh, evolutionary evolutionary history. Uh, for instance, uh, it uh, probably would be connected with human civilization because uh, when human being be uh, became civilized and they started living in uh, you know uh, uh, societies or they built homes for themselves, they started domestication of different animal species and they started destruction of habitats of other species as well, then uh, probably these parasites would have sensed that behavior, that the human uh, species is growing in population and the parasite has to do something because other animal species were not available to complete the life cycle. That's why it would have um, shifted its strategy from uh, you know, one that uh, was infecting a different kind of animal species to one that is infecting human beings right now. So there are a number of changes that we would talk about that take place inside uh, these insects that would make these parasites perfect for infecting human beings. And there is no cyst stage in the life cycle of this particular parasite. So uh, if you look at other parasites, if, and if you compare other parasites with this particular parasite, you would come to know that other parasites have a cyst stage, is an essential stage in their life uh, cycle because uh, cyst uh, helps this, with the survival of those parasites is uh, when the when the conditions are adverse for instance the environmental conditions are not favorable then the parasite would just uh, go for cyst formation because uh, it can withstand all those environmental conditions that uh, can destroy a naked parasite but this is not the case with these hemoflagellates that we are talking about today so let's first talk about the African uh, trypanosomiasis, which is also called the sleeping sickness. It's a severe meningoencephalitic disease that develops after an acute lymphatic infection, you know. Uh, severe meningoencephalitic disease means that your brain tissue or the covering of your brain uh, could be affected as a result of this infection. And this is the case with this particular infection because when somebody is infected, uh, the parasite uh, primarily or initially would live in the lymphatic system or the, in the lymph nodes that are running along your blood vessels. It's a different uh, system, the lymphatic system. Things coming out of your blood system uh, are going into the lymphatic system. So it runs parallel uh, to uh, the blood circulatory system. And from there, uh, the inside the lymphatic system, this uh, particular parasite would multiply. And after that, it would uh, just uh, 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 be transferred to the blood. And from the blood, uh, you know, it would cross the blood brain barrier and infect your brain tissue or the meninges, the covering of your brain. So that could be really fatal result of uh, fatal complication of this condition. Uh, it is caused by this protozoan uh, parasite, which is known as Trypanosoma brucei. Uh, it's a species of the Trypanosoma genus. And transmission to humans is by a vector, which is known as a CC fly. This is a vector, a CC fly here. So we will also talk about the CC fly a little bit. There is one slide uh, in which I will uh, just uh, tell you about the fly a little bit. Uh, the CC fly is found only in African region. That's why the condition is also prevalent in African countries. Uh, there are different species of the Trypanosoma brucei, this particular parasite. There are different types of it. Uh, for instance, the uh, T. brucei gambians uh, cause the West African sleeping sickness. 
while another uh, form, which is known as the T. brosii uh, rhodesians, is causing the East African sleeping sickness. These are two different forms. And they also differ in terms of the severity of the disease. For, in, for, for example, in the case of uh, Rhodesians, uh, the disease is more severe. It is more fatal. It is more quick uh, because when somebody is infected, his brain tissue can be damaged within weeks. And uh, you know the prognosis is poor in the case of this particular infection. And the Gambians, although it is infecting more people, it's a more chronic type of infection. There is uh, this, uh, you know, uh, aspect of chronicity in this, that the infection would last longer for a long, long time, you know, or, and it would cause sleeping disturbance in people, and it can also uh, cause other complications later. But it would take a lot of time. If you look at the epidemiological picture of the disease, it is prevalent in the sub-Saharan uh, uh, African region, sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see in this picture. It includes all these uh, countries like Angola, Chad, and uh, the Congo Republic and other, all these Zambias and different countries that you are seeing here. This is called the sub-Saharan Africa. And it is prevalent here in the sub-Saharan Africa because the particular vector that I talked about, the CC fly, is prevalent here. There are lots of different species of the CC fly. Um, uh, 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 almost 30 different species are found in this particular region, but not in other parts of the world. That's why uh, the life cycle of this particular parasite could be completed there. Uh, the T. brosii gambians accounts for more than 98% of cases of sleeping sickness, you know. Uh, this is, you know, the culprit, the T. brosii gambians. It is causing more infections in people, but as I told you, it is less severe, it is chronic, and the fatal one is the other one, Rotsins, uh, that uh, we talked about. The annual number of cases from 7,000 to uh, 10,000, and it's still prevalent in many sub-Saharan countries. If you look at the history of the disease, there have been a number of epidemics, uh, you know, in the past century. Uh, one between 1896 to 1906, an epidemic spanning for about 10 years in Uganda and the Congo Basin. And then in the 19 20s, a number of African countries, uh, you know, experienced epidemics of this particular disease. Or recently, uh, in 1970s, an epidemic started, and it lasted uh, till late 1990s. You know, so it's a long time. The epidemic just uh, spanned over several decades. In 1920, epidemic was controlled by mobile teams which screened millions of people. That's why there were, uh, the, the disease was uh, not reported for a number of years and then there were few cases. But after this success, surveillance measures were relaxed which led to reappearing of the disease or re-emergence of uh, this particular disease as a result of that negligence, that uh, the surveillance efforts were. And that's why when the surveillance efforts decreased, it reappeared in uh, the 21st century as well. And it's even now prevalent in different parts of Africa. Uh, so um, if you uh, look at the morphology of this particular uh, parasite, it's very interesting. There are different morphological forms. We also call them different developmental stages of the parasites that you can see here. Uh, it can be in this form, which is known as the tripomastigote form. Uh, it can be in this form, which is known as the epimastigote form, or it can be a promastigote, or it can be an amastigote. Okay, these are different forms, and you can find these different forms in different uh, hosts and, and different species 
uh, different uh, 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 time frames in different time frames as well. And these are called tripo, epi, pro, or amastigoid because of the position of the flagellum that you see and the undulating membrane in this body and its proximity to the nucleus, as you can see. So in all these, this, uh, you know, undulating membrane, the flagellum, and the position uh, is different. And that defines this uh, morphology, morphological, uh, you know, identification of these parasites uh, in, in uh, animal species or in insects. So what is their significance? Uh, the tripomasticote form is also, this form is also known as the bloodstream form because it is found in the blood of the infected person. And it is an infective form and it also is a replicative form because it replicates and I will tell you a detail of it uh, in the life cycle later. Uh, the epimastigote is a replicative stage in insects. Okay, this is a replicative stage in insects. This is also a replicative stage, but it is in uh, human beings or in the mammals. And this one, the pro-mastigote, is an infective stage of Leishmania species. We'll talk about it later. A, a mastigote is the non-motile intracellular, uh, you know, uh, form of this particular parasite. So you see that there are well-developed, uh, you know, uh, organelles for locomotion in these uh, parasites. And some forms can be non-motile, which live intracellularly. If you look at this picture, this is a micrograph showing you the same morphology. The flagellum is here, the undulating membrane is here, the nucleus is here. Okay, and these are different RBCs. It lives as it lives inside the blood. So it's a blood section, micrograph of a blood section that is telling you about the morphology of this particular parasite. Now, if you look at the transmission, life cycles are essentially identical uh, in the case of uh, different, these different forms of uh, the T. brosii. Uh, the Rhodesian form primarily is an animal pathogen. This is a zoonosis which reservoirs in wild grazing animals of East Africa. The parasite progresses rapidly into the central nervous system when occasionally transmitted to humans by uh, glossinum or satin species of the CC fly. So you remember about this species of the CC fly, which is uh, transmitting uh, the Rhodesian form of the parasite. And it is also clear here that the parasite progresses rapidly into the central nervous system. This rapidity or uh, this, uh, uh, you know, quick uh, progression uh, from uh, just infection to infection of the central nervous system is characteristic of the Rothschild farm. And that's why the Rothschild farm is uh, 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 more fatal. Uh, the Gambian farm is transmitted by, uh, by another species of the CC fly, which is known as Glossina palpalis. So Glossina uh, palpalis uh, is another group. And, uh, you know, these are blood sucking insects, actually. They feed on blood. These are all uh, female uh, Glossina species that we are talking about. Uh, they need blood for different purposes, human blood or blood from other animal species. And uh, this uh, particular species is involved in the transmission of the Gambian form of the T. brosii. Although pathogenic in humans, an asymptomatic reservoir can be found in domestic pigs. It means that the parasite can also live inside pigs, although it would not be producing symptomatic disease or the symptoms of the disease will not appear and it will be uh, there and this pig would serve as a reservoir for that particular parasite. In humans, it is causing the symptomatic disease and symptoms are produced in humans as a result of infection. 
Uh, so uh, if you look at immune responses, when uh, some organism is infected, then different kind of immunological responses uh, would be initiated or triggered inside uh, your body. Uh, so similar to other microbes and parasites, uh, tribinosomes challenge the immune system and induce a host response. So it's just like other microorganisms. It's not different from them. So this parasite host interaction would do something. Number uh, uh, one, A, a poor immune response may be triggered with a consequent devastating hyperinfection. So if uh, the immune response is not proper, it is uh, not stronger, it is a weak immune response, then uh, it can lead to uh, devastating hyperinfection or it will give more chances to the parasite to flourish there and cause more problem or more damage inside the body. Uh, it can be an exaggerated life-threatening immune response also with overwhelming consequences. So this is just like a COVID situation. In COVID-19, uh, you have seen that uh, there is an exaggerated response by your body, you know? And that cytokine storm, which is uh, generated inside your body as a result of infection with coronavirus, is life-threatening because most of people die because of that uh, particular uh, response which is generated there, you know? So, uh, this kind of response is can also be generated in the case of parasitic infections. I also have told you about other infections and I'm telling you it again in the case of these hemoflagellates that similar kind of cytokine storm can be uh, you know triggered as a result of infection of this. So this can also be life-threatening. A poor response and an exaggerated response, both can be life-threatening. So what are the uh, innate immune responses that would be uh, triggered first? Uh, the innate immune responses are uh, different kind of responses. Uh, would start right from the bite of the fly. When the fly would bite a particular person, there would be a local skin reaction that would include uh, you know, uh, that would be due to different uh, kind of mast cells that we have studied, okay? And uh, their effect and how they decrease different, uh, uh, you know, substances that would initiate the inflammatory response. And at the side of, uh, you know, bite, after some days there would be a chancre or ulcer formation. And that ulcer formation uh, you know, uh, it's a, a prominent ulcer which can be differentiated from other, uh, you know, uh, mosquito bites. And uh, from here, uh, the parasite then uh, would, uh, from the chancre, it would move into the lymphatics, your lymphatic system where the parasite will multiply and it would also encounter different kind of cells of your immune system. So some of the cells already have encountered the parasites and now other cells would encounter it in your lymphatic system, which mainly include these uh, CD8 positive T cells are involved in this response and some B cells, neutrophils and macrophages would be recruited to that particular site. And these macrophages and neutrophils and other cells, they would start secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines like different kind of interleukins or T1 necrosis factor alpha. But this kind of response is not sufficient to cover uh, this particular or uh, to neutralize the threat in the case of these hemoflagellates or the T brosii that we are talking about. And the more neutralizing response is generated by you, your humoral immune system or the antibody dependent responses are stronger as compared to the innate immune responses. And our antibodies are produced against VSGs uh, and uh, this response is usually neutralizing, but it also can be uh, eluded by 
uh, this particular parasite, and uh, we will talk about it in the next slide, that how the humoral immune system is deceived by the parasite. To be successful, the parasite needs to poise its behavior between these two extremes, avoiding indiscriminate killing of the host and still escaping destruction by the immune system. So the parasite is not trying to kill its host because when uh, the parasite would kill its host, there would be problem for the survival of the parasite uh, itself. Uh, that's why it is keeping a balance, you know. Uh, although it's uh, rapidly growing in six hours, it multiplies every six hours inside your blood. But again, the number of the parasite uh, is kept at certain limit, you know. Uh, it doesn't increase, uh, you know, uh, it uh, would not pass that particular, surpass that particular limit, you know. And it's a kind of quorum sensing, you know to uh, when, when that particular number is sensed by the parasite, then the parasites in the blood would stop multiplication. They would no longer multiply inside the blood uh, and uh, the number of them would be in a certain limit. So this is not just, uh, you know, uh, a blind process that the parasite would just go in go on and on and multiply and that would result in extreme pressure on the host and the host may die as a result of that because its uh, destination is far away from here it's slowly moving from the skin to your brain tissue and it is very well focused on that uh, goal that destination to reach out to the brain tissue okay so along the way it would do different uh, things in order to escape uh, different immune responses and not to kill the host before that until it uh, achieves its goal. So uh, before immune evasion, just uh, talk about these replicative stages that uh, well, the replicative stages uh, are in different uh, uh, the developmental stages. They are different developmental stages of this particular parasite. Within the vector, the parasite undergoes through transformation that prepares it to infect the human host. And that's what I told you before, that the parasite has become clever enough to transform in a way to produce molecules that are infectious to human beings. And that's uh, an evolutionary characteristic that it has uh, uh, you know, evolved over times. So there are different developmental stages. The replicative procyclic stage, in which the parasite surface is covered by procyclins. These procyclins are the procyclic form is formed uh, in these uh, insect hosts, and uh, it's a replicative procyclic form which is formed there. In tripo epimastigot forms is relays the non-replicative infective metacyclic form, okay? The tripomastigot, uh, epimastigot form, and uh, the non-replicative infective metacyclic form in the salivary glands of this particular insect develops in the vector salivary glands. These forms are developed there, and this form is infective, and when the, uh, uh, it will bite some particular person, then, uh, this infective form would uh, just uh, enter his body and enter the bloodstream. As a pre-adaptation to their life cycle in humans, the metacyclic parasites begin to express and be densely covered by the variant surface glycoproteins. We call them VSGs, okay? So it happens uh, to this. Uh, you know, it's a pre-adaptation to their life cycle in humans. Uh, there are um, these metacyclic parasites that have entered the bloodstream. They would begin to express and be densely covered by the variant surface glycoproteins. These variant surface glycoproteins are not expressed in the insect forms, you know. In the bloodstream form that I uh, told you about, 
these variant surface glycoproteins are expressed and there are uh, there is a lot of variation there in these uh, VSGs. There are different 100 different genes but a single locus. So it has to be shifted to that locus, a, gene, a particular gene which has to be expressed. So there are 100 different genes coding for different kind of VSGs and it is an important immune uh, evasion system of this particular parasite. Once the metacyclic uh, form invades the human host, the parasite develops into the bloodstream form. Here in the VSG triggers a humoral immune response. So the VSGs, the VSGs are secreted. They cover this particular parasite. And humoral or antibody response, as I told you, is stronger and it can neutralize the parasites in most cases. Uh, so the, his humoral response is uh, directed against this particular antigen or the VSG that, I, uh, that, that we are talking about. And inside the blood, you know, this particular parasite is, it is uh, uh, undergoing this process. It would express different kind of VSGs. So uh, when humoral response or antibodies would be generated against a particular type of VSG or the variant surface glycoprotein, and uh, the parasite would just secrete another VSG, uh, then th that parasite would become a different parasite for the immune system. And that parasite can evade the immune system because those antibodies would be directed against the first uh, uh, parasite which had a different uh, VSG. But now this one had a di has a different VSG. That's why these humoral responses would not work against this parasite, you know? So this process is uh, relatively quite quick and uh, things are happening in a quick succession. That's why it is giving chances for the parasite to survive there and to transmit to other tissues along the way. To avoid this humoral response is essential for survival. While in the bloodstream, the parasite changes its cover periodically and shifts into the surroundings, the expressed VSGs, thus evading the consequences of the immune system activation. So the VSGs which are produced, they, when they are shed in, along the way, is it going towards its destination? It, along the way, it's also secreting these molecules, these VSGs on its surface. So uh, these are also shed there in uh, the tissues. And the immune system is uh, directed against VSGs that are shed there. And the parasite is coming up with new VSG molecule. That's why it's a kind of exhaustion for your immune system to cope with this situation uh, and to uh, go for de novo responses when uh, already there, there is a memory of a particular VSG there. So it exhausts your immune system and in this way the parasite survives and <coughs> sorry, it just moves on to its destination, which is the brain. So this is the life cycle of the parasite, uh, you know, that CDC has published. We can start from here when uh, this CC fly uh, takes a blood mean. And along the blood mean, the blood, in the bloodstream, there are tripomastigotes in the bloodstream. These are ingested by the CC fly. When these tripomastigotes are ing uh, ingested, then they migrate into the mid-gut of the CC fly, and the bloodstream tripomastigotes transforms into, uh, you know, bloodstream tripomastigotes transform into procyclic tripomastigotes. As I told you that uh, procyclins are attached to these uh, parasites when they enter the mid-gut of uh, you know, or the insect or the CC fly. So, apart, uh, the, you know, uh, there were VSGs on the surface in human beings and there would be pro uh, cyclins on the surface here in the mid gut of this particular uh, parasite. Uh, this, day. This, pro, this is called pro cyclic uh, tripomasticote because of that. And this is also a, 
a multiplying state where it multiplies by binary fission into uh, you know each one would multiply into two then uh, from here the procyclic type of mastigotes leave the medgut and transform into epimastigotes okay so they would tra be transformed into this form which is the epimastigot form a different morphological form is they leave the medgut and they go towards the salivary glands. The epimastigotes multiply in salivary gland. They would again undergo another cycle of multiplication in the salivary gland and transformation as well, which would take place. They transform into metacyclic tripomastigotes. Okay, so this is again a metacyclic form, uh, which is known as the metacyclic tripomastigote. Okay, so uh, here. Uh, you know, the CC fly takes a blood meat and injects this metacyclic tripomastigote into the human being. And what happens in the human being from the skin into the lymphatic tissues, into the blood, from the blood to the brain? That is the rule. So, injected metacyclic tripomastigote transform into bloodstream tripomastigote. We call them bloodstream tripomastigotes, as I told you <coughs> before. You can see here and uh, which are carried out to other sites. And tripomastigotes multiply by binary fission in the blood here as well, and other body fluid like the lymph and spinal fluid, which are important with respect to diagnosis of this particular parasite as well. So the tripomastigote form divides by binary fission and the tripomastigotes in blood again are ready to be taken up by another CC fly in order to, uh, you know, uh, trigger or initiate uh, its life cycle stages inside the CC fly. So two genetically very distant hosts and the parasite is quite clever to uh, complete its life cycle in them. The modes of transmission, uh, the most common method of transmission is by the bite of the CC fly. Mother to child transmission, uh, you know, uh, some people uh, say it's very rare. The data is scarce on this particular aspect uh, because, you know, uh, this particular parasite also is lethal uh, for the embryo, you know. So uh, it causes infertility in pregnant uh, women or in animals as well. So that's why the mother to child transmission is controversial. Mechanical transmission has been documented. And how would the mechanical transmission take place in the case of a parasite? Uh, this parasite can be transmitted to uh, human beings by other vectors, which are not intermediate hosts of this particular, uh, are, are not proper hosts of this particular parasite, because the life cycle stages are not completed over there. So maybe some other kind of hosts are involved in the transmission. That's why we call it uh, the mechanical transmission, which can be infective for the human beings who are infected as a result of the bite of other vectors. Accidental infections from laboratories is quite possible. Uh, and uh, the road uh, for this kind of infection would be uh, the needle prick, et cetera, for instance. And it's a, a very common thing. The needle prick is involved in the transmission of a number of infections around the world in different labs. <clears throat> if you look at the pathogenesis, the incubation period is two weeks. And uh, the trypanosoma chancre, uh, you know, is formed at the site of the bite. It's a kind of ulcer which is formed there at the site of the bite. And as I told you before, that first it would go into the lymphatics after uh, the skin barrier has been crossed. And in large lymph nodes, especially posterior cervical region, uh, lymph nodes, cervical region is your, uh, the region here in the neck region, behind your neck. You can say these are cervical vertebras and there is the lymphatic system as well. So it would go and multiply over there. And it also uh, sometimes would cause some kind of swelling there. 
Uh, the bloodstream uh, parasites, they would cause headache and fluctuating fever, fever, the muscle and joint pain, irregular arrhythmias, rage, invasion of the bone marrow, and enlarged liver and spleen, generalized weakness. These are, uh, uh, you know, the signs when the parasite is in the blood and it is multiplying there. And it can also bring about, uh, uh, you know, inflammation of the brain when it invades your central nervous system. Severe headache, mental apathy, slow speed, deep sleep, coma, and death are the result of inflammation of the brain by this particular parasite when it goes there and multiplies there. In East African trypanosomiasis, uh, disease runs more rapid in fatal course as compared to other forms of the disease that we talked about. So these are the clinical uh, features, characteristics in the case of Gambians and Rhodesians. Uh, the progression in case of uh, the Gambians form of the African uh, sleeping sickness is slow, while in the Rhodesian form, it's rapid progression as we talked about it before. And stage one symptoms of uh, the Gambians infections include fever, headache, and malice. While in the case of Rhodesians, uh, fever, swollen lymph nodes, and itching are the common signs. Time of the central nervous system invasion, uh, the Gambian form, it would take about one to two years, while the Rhodesian form, it would take about four to five weeks. So that is far quicker as compared to the Gambians. And that's why I told you that the Gambians uh, you know, uh, uh, trypno, uh, trypanosoma brucia is causing chronic type of infection. A long uh, chronic infection <clears throat> would usually take a long time. But this is acute uh, type of infection. The road is found, it's quite quick. Uh, stage two symptoms would include daytime sleep sleepiness and uh, with nighttime sleeping disturbance, paralysis, and coma in the case of Gambians. Okay, these are stage two symptoms <clears throat> when the parasite would have reached your central nervous system. Then there can be a problem. These problems can ensue. First sign would be sleepiness. Uh, uh, you know, daytime sleepiness that you will feel sleepy all the time during the daytime. And at nighttime, your sleep will be disturbed. And that would be followed by paralysis and coma uh, afterwards, you know. So these are the signs indicating that uh, the parasite has reached its uh, destination, the goal. All the things that he was doing actually to reach out to that particular position or spot in the body, that parasite is already there. In the case, of uh, Rothschilds, which is far quicker here, uh, mental deterioration would take place, uh, you know, and time to death in the case of uh, the Gambians, when you have these mild sign uh, symptoms, uh, you know, uh, then it would take about two to four years. And in the case of Rothschilds, Rothschilds is quite quick and that happens within months. The diagnosis uh, for screening serological tests are being implied, available only for the Gambian's form, <clears throat> not for the Rhodesian form, but serological tests are not reliable and sometimes these antigen antibody detection systems have problems. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Microscopic examination is being carried out. It's a, a very common technique. And different fluids like the lymph and blood and stage one infection and the cerebrospinal fluid in stage two infection that we talked about is uh, used for direct uh, you know, observation of the parasite in these samples. The parasites are not, visibly, uh, not easily visible in T. gambians infections. And so concentration techniques may be used. 
okay so you can concentrate samples in different ways you can evaporate some samples uh, large quantities of samples to make it smaller concentrated and then you can look for the parasite in them where the parasites may not be uh, too much in number that's why you have to do apply these concentration techniques or you can uh, do concentration by other means as well uh, examine wet mounts of aspirates from chancre insect bite site okay we can just uh, make wet mounts from the chancre or the ulcer which it has made on the surface of the body or blood the buffy coat of the blood that you can take and look for the parasite for the presence of tribenosomes numbers of organisms peak during the fever spikes when the fever is high it means the parasite is replicating at that particular stage and you can find many of the parasites uh, at that particular time so the time of taking samples is also important for diagnosis of trypanosomes and this is the last slide uh, of this uh, presentation the rest uh, will be delivered later uh, it's about this uh, fly glossina uh, fly uh, you know this particular fly is a different fly from other uh, there are 30 different species of this fly prevalent in the african region transmitting these different kind of parasite which is not laying eggs this uh, <clears throat> particular insect actually is laying larvae directly you know it's more like a mammalian behavior in these insects uh, and this uh, particular fly lives for about 100 uh, days that is the lifespan of this particular fly and there are different species of them as we talked about the gambians and rhodesian farms are transmitted by different species of this particular fly so vector control is important for uh, this uh, uh, con uh, for containing this condition uh, vector uh, control programs are also in place which include different kind of uh, genetically engineered insects uh, are being used different kind of chemical approaches insecticidal approaches are being used and the treatment options for the disease are also there which can be successful in some cases if the uh, parasite has not uh, reached its final destination so that was for today so hope you join me again next time or hope you, uh, you, you if you visit my channel next time you can find a sequence of these lectures we would talk about chagas disease so we are talking about different diseases different immunological uh, conditions on uh, different aspects of virology on the channel so next time see you again with another lecture thank you so much for your time